Calais' makeshift refugee camp, the jungle, home to around 10,000 people, including children. This place has been partially demolished once already and reappeared, but the French government wants it gone again and will start knocking it down within weeks. A world away from the squalor of the camp, Lily Allen is working on her new album in a studio in North London. What do you think you can achieve by going there? Save everyone! No, um, <laughs> uh, I hope that, I hope to, you know, on a personal level to just see things for myself so that I, I know and I can talk openly about it, having, you know, experienced it even for a very short amount of time. And, humanise the people that are there because at the moment what I read is you know all these articles which are very dehumanising about people and and children you know I've, I'm a mother I've got two little girls and if something happened in this country and something was to happen to me and their dad and they were displaced and had to make a run for it I would really hope that other parts of the world were a little bit more helpful than we seem to be being it would seem to me that there are people that have been driven very far away from what they know and love and stability and comfort. I don't think anyone would choose to live in the jungle. No one would choose that. With Lily for this trip is Josie Norton. These two are old friends. Josie used to work in the music industry before giving it up to start a charity called Help Refugees a year ago. Right next to the camp, this massive warehouse shows the scale of the charity work that's quickly emerged to provide for those living in the jungle. An army of volunteers looks after a constantly expanding population, and today, Lily is one of them. This is just kids stuff of mine. Yeah. My kids said that you could have. <laughs> uh, shoes, jackets, um, jumpers. Snow White costume, which will come in really oh, handy, I'm sure. It's actually really sweet. And then it's time to enter the jungle. Lily Allen's never been to a refugee camp of any kind, so this is her first experience, and it's on our doorstep. This is a bus for women and children in the camp. Volunteers here tell Lily that one of the things they're constantly doing is telling young people, like this Afghan teenager, to apply for asylum in France, rather than constantly risking their lives jumping on trucks to the UK. They are risking their lives every time they go out to try. They are going out to the lorry parks or onto the motorway and trying to stow away in the back of lorries. There's been numerous deaths. Not just the deaths, because you, you hear about the people killed, you're not hearing about the people who are severely injured. So there's a number of children who've been severely injured. One of the main reasons that Lily's here is to meet for herself people like him, children and teenagers calling this place their home. There are 1,022 unaccompanied children in this camp. With the imminent closure of the camp, there are a massive risk of trafficking or just getting lost in the system. A huge proportion of them have got the right to be in the UK because they have family there. And another huge proportion of them have the right to be in the UK because of the passing of the Dubs Amendment in May. And still, right now, there's not one child been brought to the UK under that amendment. The Dubs Amendment was an agreement by the UK government to take in unaccompanied refugee children from Europe. At this youth centre in the camp, there's a sense of urgency today. The volunteers are recording details of the teenagers here, so they can try and keep track of them when the camp's demolished and continue trying to get those who have the right to be in the UK across the channel. Um, 
So what I want is anybody who has family in England that hasn't started the process. Lily meets 13-year-old Shamsher from Afghanistan. He says his father's in Birmingham. He's been in the camp for two months now. Why did you leave Afghanistan? The camp's closing in a couple of weeks. What are you going to do? So you've been trying to jump on lorries to get over into the UK. Has that, is that, that must be terrifying. Is that scary? And I know you're trying to get onto the lorries every night, but from what I'm hearing from the refugee um, volunteers here in the campus that you have got a legal right to be in the UK. So I wonder, have you started that process? Do you, have you filled out the forms? What, what are your hopes for the future? Just seems that three different intervals in this young boy's life, the English in particular, have put you in danger. We've, you know, bombed your country, put you in the hands of the Taliban, and now putting you at risk, risking your life to get, in, get into, into our country. That seems, I apologize on behalf of my country. I'm sorry for what we put you through. <laughs> sorry. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> and now I'm making you do this interview. <laughs> It's just desperate, isn't it? It's, it's, it's desperate. I'm shocked, really, that this is happening in such close proximity to, you know, where we live. It's, it feels like it's just it's people just managing to cope. Something has to be done because it can't really... It's inhumane, isn't it? Life is easier for me if... I put this stuff out of out of mind, you know, and that's not it's not really right or correct appropriate response to humanitarian crises. Like, this is these these people's lives. Like it's not this is just a day out of my life, but this is their existence, and I think it must be the like the not knowing, the uncertainty of what comes next. But no one's chosen to be here and it's not fair, you know, we live in a, it's a, it's, it's a lottery, isn't it? It's a geographical lottery, wherever you're born in the world. I know that I wouldn't like to end up here though. I certainly wouldn't want my children to end up here.